uh, today we have Joseph Franciforte, guest, and we're going to discuss, what do we want to discuss? How are you, Joe? I'm doing great. You're doing great. We're, this is the first episode where I'm uh, filming this uh, uh, video series, not in my living room, but we're in your recording studio, mm. right? What, why, why am I here, you might ask? <laughs> We're finishing up Gene's uh, Gene's record, and uh, yeah, we just mixing. literally, as of thirty seconds ago, finished uh, printing the last mix. We move, we move quickly. F finishing the mixes, the last mix, thirty seconds, boom. Yes. We're filming this. <laughs> uh, this is this is your studio. Correct. It moved from Brooklyn to Westchester. Yes, my hat. This is my place in Westchester, and yep. uh, my studio here downstairs. Beautiful. We mixed the record. It's our third record working together. Yep, third one. Time has gone quick. Man, six years, seven years. Probably six or seven, yeah. Right, well, maybe even more because of the COVID thing. This record was delayed for like year, over a year and a half. Yeah, probably that was a, done a year ago, yeah. Yeah, that was a heck of a delay ride. What can I say? We were supposed to record May of... Uh, 2020. 2020, yeah. And we finally recorded it in November of 2021. Right, right. So, anyway, but you're like, what do you call it? You have men with many faces as far as the music is concerned, right? Because you, you, between you and I, we worked as, like, me, the band leader, and you're the audio engineer. Right. Right, whether at Bunker and now at your own uh, Gray Face Studios. But you also do your own music, right? Yes. Are you a drummer? Yeah, I started on drums. That's my, you're, my you're, first instrument. Your first instrument is drums. Correct. And I see that you have vibraphone yep. over there. Vibraphone. I play vibraphone. some mallets. I play some a little bit of keys, keyboards, right, right, right. stuff like and that. And we actually hosted a concert together at Skulls. Yes. Where you actually did some electronics with that uh, German uh, vocals. Theo Blechman. Theo Blechman. Yep. Right, right. That was pretty wild. Wow. So you do the electronic music what do you call that uh, just electronic music or yeah i mean that's kind of electronica uh, i guess i mean there's not you know i mean my ambient. thing is more experimental Ex ambient uh, experimental using a bunch of electronic uh musical instruments yeah um but you also i remember i have one of your albums and that was a great album actually which one is this? Uh, I don't remember the title. It of has that. drums, or yes, yeah, it's yeah, like oh. a whole band. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a yeah, that's called the Cellar and Point. That was right. a, like a band of mine where I composed and played drums and uh, yeah, played some other stuff, keyboards. Very and stuff very like sophisticated music. And uh, I, guess what, so. I, I didn't know that you knew that record. That's cool. well, I have it in my iTunes. Oh, interesting. So you know, uh, I've been I check it out every once in a while, and cool. I was like, wow, man, interesting. This guy is, uh, no, no one is a good audio engineer. <laughs> well, I think you, as an audio engineer, when did you start becoming an audio engineer? What, what was the, uh, what, Ooh, I, the starting point? Why did you decide to do audio engineering? It wasn't really a, I guess it wasn't a decision. It was more just something that I naturally flowed into. Um, I had like in high school, you know, bands you know as you do rock bands right. or and we would start writing original but you were playing drums i was playing that. drums yeah at that so time. you're like a musician first yeah way. definitely played drums my childhood and then started these bands kind of we started writing our own music stuff like that and um and we wanted to record it uh, or, i mean you know start documenting some of the music so i first started with just very kind of minimal gear learning how to record bands and then it kind of evolved from there eventually i bought like a little digital 16 track where you could kind of do some overdubbing and and it got mm -hmm. a little more sophisticated and then by the time i got to college i had you know recorded different bands around the area so i, I basically i kind of had a background in it from starting around 14 or 15 I see. Re recording and then um, as I got older, you know, I didn't really study it in college and I kind of took a break. At that point, I was studying more composition and uh, computer programming as it relates to music and stuff like that. And then after college is really when I got back into doing engineering, like as a, a job, you could say, um, at first just kind of. In college, you went to Berkeley. Berkeley and Boston. Boston, yeah. yeah that was, That's your, you, 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 me too. I'm well, a modder, right? yeah. so yeah, yeah. Uh, probably older than you, but. <laughs> 
couple of years, but couple, couple, couple not too years, far. Couple years, not, not too, too far. far. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so you went to Berkeley as a musician, or yeah, I studied piano there. Um, but I was really I was in what was called music synthesis at the time. It oh, was like yeah. uh, it was more about like electronic music synthesizers, you know, software programming stuff like that. So I wasn't I was definitely studying jazz and playing you know in the small groups yeah, playing yeah. piano. Although drums was my first instrument, I could have I probably should have studied drums there, but I ended up doing piano cuz oh, I, I wanted to try to challenge myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did that and uh yeah, I didn't really do too much audio engineering when I was in college. Right, cuz I mean, Berkeley has that whole major, right? MPE, yes. music production. Music production and engineering. engineering. Yeah. yeah. I see. So you went from Boston, and then you came back. You came south. Came back. Came south. This is where I'm from. You, oh, you're from around this area, Jersey. Yeah, Jersey's where I grew up. Yeah, and so I came back to New York. Well, let's yeah. see, 2008. That was when I got out of Berkeley. Oh, okay, yeah. so 13, 13 years ago, time flew by. Oof, yeah, it feels about like a year ago, but yeah, 13 years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, tell me about it. I yeah. feel like I was running around Boston as a kid just. Maybe a week ago, but yeah. now man, yeah. man, it's just, I'm about to retire every time. <laughs> senior citizen. Oh man, so you're here now. I got a little studio here. Uh, did you? You also had a studio in Brooklyn. Correct. That that, that was right next to my house. I yeah. walked to your that studio the last time we uh, mixed. Yeah, that was the that, last couple uh, albums. Yeah. That, that's not no longer for you. Uh, yeah. Well, it's still, as far as I know, I think it's still operational. But I took my basically when the pandemic started. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I decided to kind of um, start pulling some gear home because um, my girlfriend and I have this house for two years and clients were saying, yeah, I don't want to come mix with you in person. So I was like, they were like, can you just do it remotely? So it was kind of stupid to keep commuting back and forth to Brooklyn. So anyway, long story short, I started pulling one piece of outboard gear, another right. piece of outboard gear. And before you know it, I had a home Right. studio and then at a certain point i just made the decision to lose the space oh in so yeah that's yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like you, i mean if you wouldn't if you keep two the you know the the, the the maintenance and also the expense is a little bit yeah i mean and at a certain point i just didn't want to have doubles of all the gear doubles, yeah, so yeah, i just yeah, decided yeah, to bring yeah. it all here yeah so the pandemic man that's like 2000 early it's happened like late 2019 and by february of last year new york was pretty much closed down right correct what did you were you here during all this time uh during the pandemic yes in new york this whole area right here what, pretty what, much, yeah. so everything was pretty much shut down yep everything was shut I down mean, i know I mean, the performances was, were all stopped clubs were shut down yeah, uh yeah, yeah. you know i also do a lot of live recording of concerts and that right. was all shut down most studio sessions were shut down and right. so it was bunker like, closed you know for quite some time yeah um and also you know i mean the musicians didn't want to hang out uh get together well everybody was kind of i mean it was certainly a pandemic for the most of us in our generation it's the first time that's happened in our lives i mean people didn't know what to expect you know i thought oh maybe in two months it'll be over <laughs> Right, so I'm like, yeah, let's see. Yeah. Well, let me skip reschedule my Japan tour for two months later. Yeah, <laughs> that sure worked. <laughs> just got canceled completely. <laughs> yeah, man. So yeah, I heard from my fellow musicians who were still in New York that uh, who stayed here throughout the pandemic that everything was closed. Mm -hmm. um, was there any government money that was doled out to musicians? I mean, in theory, in it theory, didn't, didn't was. really make its way to me, but I, there were some government checks where they just gave everyone X, you know, I don't know what it was, a couple hundred bucks yeah, or a thousand couple, bucks, yeah, a thousand uh, bucks. but I didn't get that. So you're making so, too much. <laughs> no, well, I wasn't really making anything last year. I mean, for yeah, a while, yeah. but, I think, uh, yeah, but it just yeah. never came. I don't know. Yeah, maybe I, 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 didn't maybe I, I probably did something wrong. No, but, uh, I, I, we but didn't I'll, get it. It was twelve hundred bucks. Yeah, that's what. That's right. Yeah, and it depended on your tax return from the past year. Uh, okay. and if it was above a certain threshold, I see. It was, it was. But uh, wow, man, yeah. So I, I, I ended up going to Japan, man, in October of last year, and I was able to do the tour in Japan because Japan had kind of started doing gigs at last June, when they were closed for like four months. In June, they they all kind of started creatively, you know, like change the times, mm -hmm. stop serving alcohol, 
uh, put barriers between the musician and the audience. Mm. But that was that was crazy because they like vinyl drapes mm. between the stage and the audience. Wow! So you know the stage sounded like crazy. Like wow. you put like vinyl. like it was like a clear thing. Or yeah, something? it was a clear like curtain of wow. vinyl. Um, and and now this, whatever we, we pl uh, played on stage was sort of like all within, yeah. right? It didn't go anywhere because of the curtain. Yeah, oh, that's uh, bizarre. Yeah, that was bizarre. Wow. But um, yeah, but uh, in the end, in, in October the tour happened, so I was I'm so glad for that, but uh, grateful for that. But uh, then I wasn't able to come back. Yeah, you were they, stuck, right? Yeah, they they kept canceling the flights, uh, returning from Tokyo to New York. Uh, not so much because, well, the COVID was the cause of it, but because of the, all the entry bans and stuff that was worldwide around that time, there was nobody taking the f uh, flight. So these airlines, uh -huh. they, were, they, were, they were not able to fly their jumbo jet with, yeah, the, yeah. Pa you know, with, with like five passengers yeah, on it. Yeah, I see. So, but eventually I finally made it back this past June um, after 11 months in Japan. But of, but of all places to be stuck in, Tokyo was just such a wonderful, hospitable place for yeah, me. Could be worse, I, I guess. A, yeah, yeah I, and, and I kept getting a lot of work there. Um, so it was, it was a lot of fun um, doing it. So you, the recording engineer, are you still playing drums actively? I wouldn't That's say actively. Like, uh, I do it for fun. Right. I mean, but but you, I, have, you, you also have a record company. Yes. And that's called Gray Fade Records? Yeah, Gray Fade, yep. Gray Label Fade. Or whatever, Gray Fade yeah. Studio, Gray Fade Records. Yeah, they're kind of the same name. Your middle name is Gray Fade. <laughs> I'm thinking of legally, Gray legally changing that. <laughs> that's right, Joseph Gray Fade. Gray, gray Fade. Yeah. Uh, you like the color gray. I do. And you, you're always fading the faders out on your gig. <laughs> something like that. Board Fade. <laughs> yeah, Board Fade, something like that. Well, the, the couple Board Fades we had about this record is brilliantly done. <laughs> I'm going to say it was gray color, but it was brilliantly <laughs> executed. executed. Yeah, well, yeah. I like fading. I like <laughs> you like it fading. Is, it is true. So you, you have your record cup, uh, record label. Um, how many albums have you put out? We just released the third album. Um, so we've done, done three, two more in production. So right. we'll be five coming soon. But yeah, that's been a goal of mine for... You know, like you were saying, I kind of do all these different things, and I feel like the record label is where I'm trying to bring them all together into one more unified kind of outlet where I can produce the record. So some of the music is mine, some of it I'm producing other people's music, and uh, but also getting into the graphic design of the records and also the distribution and. Uh, You're taking it all on. Yeah, taking the whole thing on. Very uh, courageous uh, of you. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a lot of work, but it's so far so good. I mean, we've been selling some records and it's been, you know, it keeps moving. Is, so. is uh, all your uh, the music that you're putting out on the LP, the, the record, uh, the vinyl uh, media, or are you also yeah. printing CDs? No CDs. It's vinyl and vinyl downloads. And, and downloads. Oh, no, so. no streaming. So it's, Yeah, streaming doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, for, for me, I don't know. I mean, yeah. you know, I've had this conversation with a number of people and some artists, you know, I guess it makes sense for them for for this label it doesn't i'm kind of making the point that you know in order for these rec these records are expensive as you know and gear is expensive and making vinyl is expensive and all these things uh you know if if we want it to be sustainable then the audience ideally should uh contribute to that and i think most listeners want to contribute to it and i think the I streaming think so. the streaming services it, it are makes the audience the or i think the streaming service sort of kind of made the listeners lazy in the fact yeah. that they didn't they oh you know i don't have to you know yeah. i have to take out my wallet you or know? well i mean they're taking out their wallet well, the money is just a month yeah it's not a, it's not a lot but 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 uh but you know i find that the people i talk to about this who aren't musicians who don't really understand the economics when you explain it uh how it works and how little money is making it back to the artists uh, most of them are pretty sympathetic and they they want to help and buy records and support. So I think some of it is just, you know, getting the word out to people right. and, and making, and, and also, so with the label, I, I basically have a statement on our website that just says, you know, 
we're not on streaming services and, and here's the reasons why and I you know kind of try to list it in a uh, in our, some kind of argument form so people can understand where that's coming decisions coming from and why you know we need them to buy some downloads or vinyl in order for the music to keep getting made and uh, right. so far it's it's people seem to be responding to the that approach pretty, well, that's, pretty that's, well that's great I mean I think I think all artists in a way should do I mean I could see if you're like a like a pop artist that has 24 songs on an album at two three minutes a piece and you know each of them is 99 cents right but like somebody like or my records with eight tracks yeah, and some yeah. of the songs are 10 minutes and they're still 99 cents each you know yeah, yeah, if right. that right there's no way you know by selling single track downloads yeah, yeah. and making eight dollars seven dollars and something yeah well at least for the digital there's no overhead i mean at least it's well i mean you got to pay whoever well you got to pay to make or them, itunes yeah, or whatever yeah. but yeah, but uh, I hear you. I mean, it's the economics of it are are hard, and and uh, I think a lot of it is developing an audience and developing trying to find your audience of people who want to buy the kind of music that you're making. And uh, you know, yeah, right now it's it's not easy, but I guess I guess I, I guess I try to when people say I, that you can't do something, I try to do it. Everyone said there's no way you can run a record label; it's just not sustainable. It's not going to work. So I was like, eh, I'm going to try it. I think it sounds sounds fun. Well, it's it's amazing that you you put out four records and uh, you find like I guess P I'm mean, like I somewhere I, uh, I read that like more records have been sold in the United States this past year than than the CD itself. Yeah, yeah I, I find like, that incredible. Actually, that's incredible because uh, so what I mean, there's all sorts of record players out now. You know, new ones coming out. More so than the CD players, and yeah. uh, I don't know whether it's nostalgia or just young people kind of getting into something that they've never seen before. There's right? something. Just, it's a nicer. It's also a nicer physical object, right? right. Uh, maybe it's than a, the CD. It's a, yeah, it's a nicer, you get like a, a nice, nice jacket cover, and yeah, you, know, yeah. you get to a, kind of a library. I mean, I I grew up with LPs, even cassette tape albums, and uh, yeah. CDs, you know, super audio CDs. I love having them available, like like a book, you know, like a library. Whenever I need to check out or need, you know, as a musician, whenever I need some sort of like information musically, I have a great library that yeah. I can kind of all check it out. Just you know? pull it off the shelf, yeah. right? It's, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's basically for me like a textbook. You know, I mean, all the answers and and solutions in music that I find are already in the records. It's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Not so much in like theory books and all that. I've never been like a book oriented musician where, mm. you know, uh, because even the theory books all came after the music. They all right. kind of said, all right, this is what it's going to be after it was already mm -hmm. it was out there, you know. And so for me, it's, it's it was well, it's much faster and also for me, much more uh, pleasurable to check out the music and then f and, and figure it out for myself and. And I'm not to say that books don't have a part. So I think books and all good books uh, really kind of can speed up oh, the, the the process of learning too as mm -hmm. well. No, but I hear I hear what you're saying about having it on your shelf and being able to pull it off and yeah, not have yeah. to dig through a hard drive. And right, I mean, how many times? I, I mean, I, even even while composing for this new record, man, there's some. If I was stuck with some things or something, I might say, oh, well, you know what. Let me check out that Benjamin Britten record, mm. and, and and it might give me inspiration to somehow, you know, uh, condense that kind of thought or that kind of idea into like a trio format in a jazz context. You right. Know? It just. Well, I like, guess the younger generation they just hop on Spotify and, and Google Spotify, it or something. But I don't. Uh, yeah. But I don't, I yeah, some of it is just my own maybe ignorance or whatever. Uh, but uh, but I don't, I have a preference too for having the physical object. I like reading a liner note. I like sitting on the couch and listening through the record. I like listening in the car. Uh, I like I like CDs. I don't know. I think CDs personally. I kind of feel like that they, they might come back too at some point because they're a pretty great medium. I still think they're a great medium. They are. And they're you know they you can still rip it. You know into your digital library if you want it's a mm -hmm. it's a nice physical object they're they're cheap to make but so far i haven't done those with my lab record label but i still buy cd i mean if i have the option like say right. say someone's selling a digital download for 10 bucks and you can get the cd for 15 
I, I always say, why CD, not yeah. pay the extra five and get the physical CD, then, yeah. right? And, yeah. and support that. And if I need it in my digital library or I need to put it on my phone, then I'll just rip the CD. I mean, right. you know, so I think that's, uh, I, I still like them. But who knows as far as sales, you know, I don't know how many weirdos like us there are out there <laughs> that like having the CDs. I, it's probably well, not I that think, many. Oh, yeah, and also because CD is, as you said, rippable by anybody. You yeah. Know, that's, that's a whole bootleg area ah, that, yeah. that that kind of dark because i mean if you if you google any of my cds you'll see that somebody has ripped it in poland or some yeah. bizarre country they have their own website and they're selling it yeah, whether it's mp3 or flak downloads yeah, yeah. for like you know four not four five euros or something like that and and uh, for for a minute, I try to go after one, but it's it's impossible because they're like, what, what are you gonna do? I mean, I there was one company, England, UK, London, that did that to one of my records, and after a consulting a lawyer in London, the guy said, man, you know, even if you win, the the amount yeah. of uh, money is gonna be less than what you have to pay me as a lawyer right. to go do all the work. Yeah, he yeah. said, he says best to just just just. He said, just pretend that it was giving you free exposure in the UK. I'm like, come on. Yeah, exposure. That was the answer. I hear you. That was the, that was the, uh, the, 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 so, so by, by this kind of, you know, well, and the people who are doing it probably know this, right? So yeah, they do yeah, it. Yeah. They know that nobody's going to come after them. So there are so many websites selling like, I still, but I mean, I just feel like it comes down to the fan to be responsible yeah, enough to know that be, to, to not to not you know if you, it's you know for a small artist it's just like it's just. I mean, if you're Madonna, fine, right, you can survive. But right. for, for somebody like my jazz right. level, exactly. Uh, I mean, if you have a local restaurant that you love that you really want to go support, you're not going to go there and like steal food from the back kitchen right. when they're not looking. I mean, I feel like a lot of it. That's why I'm saying I think a lot of it is just uh, awareness of the. Of for the listeners and right. the people and, who and are I buying think, the records because right. there's always going to be bootleggers. And probably. many of the sites look legal so that they get I tricked see. that way. Interesting. Right. They, they look, they, they even yeah. say stuff like, oh, these are all like not our copyright but we've got permission to, they lie on the, you know. It's yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so it's a little bit of a negative in, in the CD. I wish, like, you know, the, the computer game world never had that because the, C, the game discs all locked. Uh -huh. Right, you yeah, can't yeah, just you can't pull easily. Yeah. Even super audio CDs, you can, but you got to take a lot more steps and just to like, yeah, to pop like, it into yeah. a. a you can't a, just take a direct digital yeah, copy or whatever, yeah. right? Yeah. So even SACD, uh, you you can, but you have to kind of collect. Yeah, I think you have to have a Sony PlayStation, something. Uh -huh. You you have to you know do make a pretty yeah uh, time consuming effort. Where a CD, anybody can just pop it into your CD ROM and. If you have any software, just rip it, you know. Right. And then you have a perfect wave copy of, of the tracks. Yeah. Which is a drag, man. But I uh, guess it's the same art. Same thing could be done in theory from a, you know, file, right? Like a digital file. I right. mean, I don't know that it's. I don't know that it's specific. I guess CD. so. I mean, let's say like I mean, I I purchased some uh, uh, high res like uh, yeah. DSD files from what was that like? Uh, HD one, tracks. Yeah, HD something. tracks right. like a, you know, and so if I wanted to. Now that I have, the, I have the files on my machine or computer, yeah. I can share it with whoever. Or, right. But I don't. <laughs> yeah, well. Because I find, well, well, why should I after I paid, you know, because they're not cheap, right? I mean, the HD downloads are 30 bucks, 25 bucks. Is that right? I got to start charging more because I'm doing, my label is doing high res as well. I do yeah. everything 9624. Yeah, yeah. But I just sell them for... 9624 sounds great, you know? Yeah, I mean, I mean well, I mean... If I, it's I, recorded I, from the beginning at that level and it yeah, kept... Yeah, yeah, keep it. Well, that's you know, what we're doing for this right, record, right? Right, right, right. I mean, yeah, I haven't experimented too much with 192 and the super high and or DSD, but uh, I might. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I, I would like to do a DSD record one, uh, one of these days, but nobody here I yeah, in the studio the have the... Yeah, it's a multi-track. Yeah, that, that's right? a whole different gear system, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. You need a whole different... Uh, just just to be able to uh, make edits and stuff on the board, correct. You have to transform it. Uh, uh, tra uh, you have to change it to PCM because yeah. it has to be done in PCM. Uh, so there's only one kind of like machine that is DSD uh, from beginning to the end. And I don't. I don't Do you know, know what it is. I I, I I did research one time. I can't recall the name of the uh, uh, machine and or the 
uh, the company that creates it. But I know in Japan, there's several studios that have done it. Actually, I have some, I have some uh, peers, jazz musicians in Tokyo who recorded them direct to uh, DSD one bit uh -huh. albums. Yeah. I haven't checked that. Well, that's record, cool. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be curious to experiment with that as well. Right. I don't have really the capability to do it here. I've been experimenting a little with 192 here on a solo record I'm making right now, which is like solo vibraphone. I've been doing that at 192. 192, 24, 24, 32. yeah, 24. And it oh, sounds. The files must be huge. They're pretty big. Yeah, they're pretty big. <laughs> but luckily, it's just stereo. I mean, I just. Well, actually, I use three mics on the vibe, so it's not too bad. But. Uh, uh, just stereo, one instrument. It's like stereo with a center mic, you know, oh, that kind so of thing. So it's three. Three yeah, tracks. It's three tracks. So it's not too bad. Yeah, can you a whole band at 192? Yeah, it would get pretty big pretty quickly. Pretty big, yeah. very quickly. One hundred gigs quickly. But I guess maybe the new uh, newer machines can handle that, right? I guess with yeah, like Pro had, Tools. I haven't had any problem with Pro Tools. And like you have the Apogee Symphony. Yeah. That, how, how many channels can that handle? That can do 32. 32? I think, yeah, 192. I think that's right. Yeah, 32. Right. It might actually it might go to sixteen. It might go down to sixteen at one ninety two. I haven't really pushed it, but I have two of these, so it could, in theory, could do thirty two. Right. And so we've done our third record together. The first two were with uh, my quintet, Fractal Traction, that I use a voice and the guitar as a front line. And then this one, I got kind of crazy and did the trio record which for me it's the hardest i think you know it's it's trio is such a hard format especially as the, as the kind of the guitar player because you have nothing to hide behind there's yeah. no piano to mask you or anything like that yeah 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 most exposed setting. it's very exposed yeah. uh and and with clarence penn and scott Colley, it's definitely a challenging uh project i thought you know but well, I thought yeah. it, that it's came odd. out great. You did a great job. The recording sounds great uh, with the mixes. I'm looking forward to getting this uh, out there. Yeah, me too. It's a great, it's a great record, and uh, there's a you guys have a great chemistry with the trio. I mean, considering also that Scott, you said you hadn't really played with him too much in no, recent years, uh, right? For a long time. I mean, he was the first bass player that I went to Europe with. Uh, this is like when I first came came to New York, and then. After that, I didn't. I haven't seen him. So, we we were both young. That it's like kind of like uh, uh, there's a Japanese fairy tale where you like you run off into the ocean and and you think it's only a week and you return and it's like literally like fifty years has gone by, and the world has changed. It's kind of like that vibe, man. I mean, because last time I saw Scott. Uh, we were like in our twenties. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, like yeah. wow. Yeah. <laughs> but he's I mean, he's turned into such a monster player. It's fantastic. He did. I mean, both Clarence and Scott really, really did a great, great job, and uh, I had a great time. And it's you know, it's always challenging to play with these these uh, high level you know people because it helps you br uh, uh, up your own game. Yeah, for sure. And to, and as a learning experience too. But uh, so if people want to contact you or hire you as an audio engineer, mm -hmm. uh, what's the best way? Just to go to your website? Do you have a website uh, online? Yeah. my my Well, this studio is called Gray Fade Studio. And it's Gray with, Fade a, with an E. So G-R-E-Y-F-A-D-E studio.com. Right. You can contact me through there or just Google my name, Joseph Bransifort, and uh, that'll take you to my personal website. Personal website, yeah. and so then, and then, because uh, you're a freelance audio engineer, right? So you work on different projects. Different studios, you know, I do most of my mixing here, but I also do live recordings and engineer at, you know, dozens of different studios in New York, so. And your music, um, same place if they want that to purchase. That would just be grayfade.com. That's the record label, and that has most of my music. So G R E Y F A D E. So they could just go to online, and then they could order your albums. Correct, or, all from or, there, or download uh, your your record, uh, your music. Now these four records are are your music. No, the first two were uh, that that was kind of a test run to try to get the dynamics of the whole thing down before I started. You know taking on other people's records but from here out it'll be mostly other people's music oh uh, so you'll be like producing yeah that's pretty much what i'm doing on these next two or three and then yeah my own music will probably a lot of it will come out there too but uh it sounds it's, very exciting man 
My man. Yeah, exciting. Woo! Cheers, man. Yeah. Joseph Brancaforte, everybody. Check out his stuff. He's a great audio engineer. I mean, he's worked on, worked on my three last records, and there's a reason I keep calling him for that. <laughs> uh, and uh, check out his uh, music, his record, all that as well. And uh, see you next ex next episode. <laughs> Joseph Brancaforte. Thanks, bro. Cheers, Gene. Yeah. All right.